I go for refuge and turn the light into the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Why make human beings so practice of giving and so forth? And I become Buddha to benefit all human beings. I go for refuge and turn the light into the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Why make human beings so practice of giving and so forth? May I become a Buddha to benefit all human beings. I go for refuge and turn the light into the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. By my accumulation or practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Sanye Jura Soge Tane Yavzo Je Dage Jin Soge Be Sonam Je Dola Benjir Sanye Jubare Je Sanye Jura Soge Je Nam La Chanjo Pardo Tane Yavzo Je Dage Jin Soge Be Sonam Je Kola benjere zange du barajo, sange chuda soge chonam la, chanju bardu tani kapsu, tage jin soge be sonam ge, tola benjere sange du barajo. In dependent origination, there is no ceasing, no arising, no annihilation. No coming, no going, no separateness, no sameness. I pray to the consummate Buddha, the supreme of all teachers, I want to taught this peace, which is free of liberations. I pray straight to the mothers of the hearers, the bodhisattvas, and the Buddhas. Good. Complete peace, which through the knowledge of parts, goes the Magus achieves the aims of the world, and through the position which helps subdue its expanded variety of teachings. The one who has transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism, the benefits of sentient beings. The teacher is rather protector to you of my frustrations. The one who has eliminated the Republican subjectalizations and is entitled with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, who turn a chance for the forever noble life rays to you, the Buddha, my frustrations. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the model full of awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. <coughs> Om ye dharma he to prabhava Shandata gato yavatat Dejan chayo niroda Evan vati mahashramana yeswaha Om ye dharma he to prabhavam he tum te shandatha gato yavatat te shanchayo nirodham evam vati mahashramana yeswaha Om ye dharma he to prabhavam he tum te shandata gato yavatat te shanchayo nirodam evam vati mahashramana yeswaha all phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata, the system causes as well as taught by the Great Seal. Profound, peaceful, elaboration free, clear light and non conversation Such as Nectar and Dharma I have discovered. Finally, no one can fathom this teaching in silence or retarded words. Beyond our training, thought and expression is the professional wisdom. <coughs> Buddhas of the three times are pure beings. All composite things are impermanent. All contaminated things are the nature of suffering. All phenomena are the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Constant sorrow is peace. The Guru is the Buddha. The Guru is the Dharma. Likewise, the Guru is the Sangha. The Guru is the source of everything wholesome. I go for a fish in the Guru. By the sound of vibrant drum of Dharma, you liberate all beings from miseries. I beseech you to kindly remain and keep teachings until the end of the expense of billions of eons. The Buddha does not watch the negative videos of beings, nor does he remove things measured by his hands. 
as per is the with folded hands I beseech the Buddhas of all directions which are a lot of karma for all the goodness is blown. If you attach to this love, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you attach to samsara, you have no body. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no body chitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. Okay, today we'll read the three principal aspects of the path. Page 78. Three principal aspects of the path by Lama Sukhapa. I bow down to the Venerable Lamas. As well as I am able, I will explain the essence of all the teachings of the Buddha, a path praised by the conqueror's children, entrance for those who desire liberation. Listen with a clear mind, you are fortunate ones. <coughs> And the craving for existence also binds beings. Thus, from the outset, seek renunciation. It was attraction to this life by reflecting on how leisure and opportunity are difficult to find and how life is very primitive without span. It was attraction to future lives by repeated thinking of the infallibility of karma and its effects and misery of samsara. Contemplating thus, when for an instant you do not admire the splendors of sacred existence, and when intent on liberation day and night, renunciation is born in you then. Renunciation, if not tempered by a pure mind of bodhicitta, however, will not bring forth the perfect bliss or for some for enlightenment. And for the wise one generate the excellent mind of bodhicitta, set up in the current of those four powerful rivers, tied by strong winds of karma, caught in the unnet of self-grasping, completely enveloped by the darkness of ignorance, born only born in boundless cycle existence, ceaselessly tormented by their three miseries. Thinking of your mothers in this condition, generate the most supreme mother of bodhicitta. Although you train in the renunciation and the mother of bodhicitta, without wisdom that realizes the ultimate reality, you cannot cut the root of sacred existence. Therefore, strive to understand dependent arising. One sees the infallible cause and effect and of all phenomena when it is in nirvana, and this was all focuses of apprehension, has entered the path which pleases the Buddhas. Appearances are infallible, dependent on arising. Emptiness is understanding that is true of assertions. As long as these two are seen as distinct, you have not yet realized the intent of the Buddhas. When these two realizations are concurrent, where the mere sight of infallible dependent origination concurrently destroys all modes of grasping to a definitive sermon, at that time the analysis will profoundly use perfected. Furthermore, appearances refute the extreme of existence. Emptiness is a the extreme of non-existence. When you understand the emptiness arises in the form of cause and effect, you are not captivated by the view of extremes. O oh my child, once you have thus realized the points of the three principal parts, seek solitude and cultivate strong determination and quickly reach the final aspired goal. <clears throat> Okay, um, for bodhicitta, um, what is also important while we learn how to practice this, the rationalities, the, the logical reasonings to, to, to generate this bodhicitta, we also need to uh, read the biographies of the great masters. For example, the biography of the Buddha, the biography of Chisumilarapa, Lama Tsongkhapa, and his holiness's biography. Um, the, we must read that. There are two biographies of his holiness. One's autobiography, where he says a freedom in exile. Freedom in exile. You must we must read this. Somehow we are connected with his holiness the Dalai Lama. Somehow there are many of us the who became interested in Buddhism and even those who were born, who were born as Buddhist. Uh, they come to take more serious understanding of the, the, the teachings of Buddha through the advice, the directions of his own Dalai Lama. We must read this biography of Freedom in Exile. And the earlier one is My Land and My People. 
there's the early year. The first biography, My Land and My People. The second one is The Freedom in Exile. We must read these biographies. This will tell us His Holiness that the Lord, being revered as the, the, the God King of Tibet, is revered as an enlightened being, Buddha, Bodhisattva, Arabidokdeshwar, and so forth. And the, say, what was the real life? And how he demonstrated compassion, how he demonstrated the, the courage, how he demonstrated the skills, the wisdom in the face of huge challenges. Okay, oh, we need to read the biographies. And for the Buddha's biography, I would say that the, uh, there's one, the series, which is the Buddha episodes. I would highly recommend all of you to watch this, and I'm sure many of you watched this already, but those who do not watch it, you must watch it. It has like 54 uh, episodes. 54 of them but initially released by ZTV and I'm not too sure if it's still available but it should be available if you Google search it okay okay thank you Okay, so the um, Venerable uh, Tupten Denzila is saying that the, she has the link. She will, those of us who are interested, you contact her, the office, and they will send you the link. Yeah, so this, you, you must watch it. And I would say that this is, when I watched it, I was really impressed. It is so well made. And the, um, that it, it displays the the Buddhist qualities of compassion, Buddhist qualities of qualities of the wisdom. They're all well demonstrated, exhibited in this in the fifty four the the series Buddha episodes. Okay, and um, of course it does not cover all the innumerable the say the compassionate gestures of the Buddha. They are not covered all, but what is covered there within 53 is, I mean, very expensive. They must have spent a lot on this, and then it is really done so well. <clears throat> so I'd like to share one, which I, I think I read, I read in one of the sutras, and it's, it was extremely, it really touched, my, uh, touched me. Uh, wow, that's amazing. The Buddhist compassion and also the, the wisdom. So what happened was that the Buddha was invited by one of the kings for a meal, and the Buddha the, attempted to buy like about 500 the monks um, there uh, for the lunch. And usually the tradition, the tradition in those days is that the, after the, the meal, then whoever is invited as the, the chief guest, the main guest, will say delegation verses, dedicating the, the merit thus accumulated for whoever, for the donor, for the mainly for the donor, and the, then the, all the other beings. So, um, <clears throat> as brothers were invited, there was one, the great donor, donor was a supporter of the Buddha, who is who was ultra rich person known as Ananda Pindika, the great merchant Ananda Pindika, who was extremely rich, and he was a great student, the devout student of the Buddha. It is believed that he he his uh, the karma is such that he acquired a skill or he acquired a power <clears throat> to just see the treasures underneath the ground with, your, with his naked eyes. Where the treasures are, he could see that. And then he dig it out, the treasures come out. Naturally, he'll become very rich. So this is the gentleman by the name Ananda Pindika. And of course, he was a great Bodhisattva. And um, one time, when the, that time when the Buddha was invited for the meal by this king, and the Buddha, along with the, all his the, the, the disciples, 
Yes, Ananda Pindika went to the very remote the, the, the villages and the the slums. He went there with his the the say the, the staff. Several staff with the huge sacks. Then he was just loudly telling everybody in this slum area, very poor people, telling them that that the Thakada has come on this earth, that the Thakada, the Buddha is on this earth today. We are very meritorious, but you don't know that the Buddha is with us on this earth. Why don't we take the maximum advantage of this? You can offer anything, whatever you have, you can make offering, and I will take your offering on your behalf to the Buddha. And take the maximum. Whatever you have, you have a small, say the the oh, the the what the five fuel, the wood, you want to offer offer it. Or a small sugar, small you know, sugar, you offer it sugar cane, or like salt, or like a bread, or whatever you have, or a needle, whatever you have to accumulate merit because why you're poor is because of not having accumulated merit of generosity now it's a great opportunity just that the Tathagata here the object to whom you make this offering and the, the benefit is going to be like innumerable times million times more so just a small gesture will make him so much merit so in future you don't have to suffer the poverty and also the future you will meet with the Tathagata's teachings. So he was making this loudly telling this to people there in the slum areas and everybody was so happy they were bringing you know something wrapped in a piece of paper or a small cloth like the sugar cane or whatever they have they offer them and he would just put everything in this sack and he had this the, the, the staff and then the um, suddenly when he was passing by there was a small hut small hut no the just um, the open space of a window but no proper window there from there very dirty stinking cloth was thrown just next to his the face and he felt so offended what is this i came here to help the people and somebody's deliberately offending me I threw this very dirty smelling cloth to his face and he's very sensible <clears throat> he told his staff where did this cloth they come from and the staff said it came from this a small hut and he sent the staff to go to, to check who is that they went in and they discovered two old couple very old both naked, very old, perhaps in 70s or 80s, and both naked, shivering. And the story behind that was that two of them are so, so, so poor that they had only one possession, that is, a small cloth to cover the lower part of the body. And when the, when the man goes out, he would use it, and the, the old lady would be inside naked and the, the man would go to back for arms and then come and share between the two. When the wife goes out, she would use it and then come share the whatever she got. And then this is the only the way of the survival, this small cloth. And, and then two of them had discussions between two of them that, yes, what we are hearing, that man is saying that this is a great opportunity for us to accumulate merit. Yes, you're right. Um, the, in this world, perhaps two of us must be the poorest in the world. Why we are poor is because of our no practice of generosity in the past. So if you don't do anything, something in this life, then the, there's no hope in the future. So it's a great opportunity that the Tathagata is here. We do not know that. And this kind gentleman, he informed us about this and he also taught us how not to suffer poverty in the future. So now what should we do? What to offer? You have nothing to offer this piece of cloth. If you piece of cloth, if you give, we're gonna go out, then we're going to die. We're going to suffer 
hunger. Then Buddha said, never mind, let's die. So rather, like, let's not, let's die in this life, in hunger, and that at least in the future lifetimes, we don't suffer again. So we offer this. But how to go? Go naked? No. So only way is by throwing this from the window. They threw this, and they, then the, the his Ananda Pindaka's staff, when they entered the house, two of them were shivering, saying that, that thinking that now they're going to beat us up for offending them, throwing this very stinking piece of cloth. And both the staff, they entered there, there's so much gentleness there, there's calmness there, not like bullish, like this. And they, then they ask, who are you? Then they narrate all the stories. They then went back to Ananda Pindika, reported this, and then Ananda Pindika put this piece of cloth into the, into the sack and collected all the things and then went to the Buddha. <coughs> then he told all the people that I'm going to tell everybody that the, the, these are the, the gifts from the poor people to the Buddha. I'm going to tell the Buddha that this is a gift from the, the poor people. And then, but he did not want to tell the Buddha because the Buddha knows everything. So what he did was that the Buddha was on the verge to complete his meal. And then he, the sack, what is this for the Buddha, what is this for the king? It was just a garbage. It's a garbage. Nothing worthwhile. But so precious. It's all coming from the heart of the poor people. So what he did was he put everything he took out from the sack in front of the Buddha. He just kept it stacked there. And the king, well, what is this? And the Buddha, it was the it was turn for the Buddha to dedicate the the merit of the offering this food. And then the dedication is always made um, for the, the the main donor. And the Buddha. What the Buddha did was that instead of dedicating the merit for the king, the king was the main donor, Buddha dedicated the merit for the two couple. And the Ananda Pindika did not, did not say anything, didn't even utter a word. He just stacked all these things there next to the Buddha and then he sat down. And then the Buddha dedicated all these merits that we have gathered here because of this meal offering. Let's dedicate this the, to the donor the two couples. And the king was a little taken aback. I'm the main donor. My name is not said. And then he interrupted the Buddha, the Tathagata, am I not the main donor? I'm the main donor. Here, I offer the food for you. And all gold, silver, all these things are there for you. I'm donating. I'm making the offering. And the Buddha said, for me, the material values don't matter. For me, the heart matters. You give all these things, but you are not risking your life. The two couple, they give this, and then Buddha just put his hand into the garbage, <coughs> pulled that, pull that cloth out, and kept it in his arm, in his hands, as always, very precious, like his own small child, and said that the donor of this is actually stinking. And the stinking, the, and the, the king cannot cover his nose because the Buddha is keeping it is very close, as very dearly. And the Buddha said that the one, the couple, old couple who offered this to me, they are risking their life. They know that they're going to die if they give this to me because they don't know how to they go to go for arms backing. So they're going to die. And yet they are ready to die to give this offering to me. So this is the most precious offering today. So I take the merit for, for these two couple. And the king, hearing how the Buddha is so loving and so compassionate, so loving towards the two couple, the king said, I could not believe that there is the, the, a couple who is so poor that was to survive on this dirty cloth. So he sent his ministers to inquire where these two couples are. And the and make sure that two of them, Buddha loved them so much, and we cannot keep them poor. We must make sure that they have proper house, they have a proper clothing, they have a proper food, they have everything. All the sustenance should be there. 
He sent the minister right in on emergency task. And the minister, they were busy in search of the two couple. And finally, they found this house and the ministers with the, all the elegant dresses they got in. And then the, the two couples were shivering even more, thinking that now that I've, we have offended the Buddha so much that the king is so angry, he must have sent the minister to kill us. And the ministers, instead of being the, the rude, they have been extremely respectful to two of them because the king said that you must treat two of them with as the, our guest, most important guest. And two of them instantly they were given a good to be in a place to good home and food, clothing, all the sustenance were, were provided by the king. So this very lifetime they were protected. So this is the Buddhist compassion. So when you, when we, each one of us, when we become Buddhas, we can see each one of them and they can, you can see their heart, their purity. For you, it doesn't matter how the, the status, it doesn't matter the, your material background. It's about the purity of the heart. Okay, this is so precious. Okay. <clears throat> so with this yesterday, um, the, we're almost done. Where, what were we doing yesterday? Uh, the altruism. Uh, we are doing the, the method of equalizing exchange of self for others, and uh, which which has nine steps. By now, I hope all of you have the nine steps on your fingertips. Right? Okay. So we did the eighth one. Eighth one is altruism. And next is the ninth one, which is Bodhicitta. So let's say that this is very important. Eighth one, which says that I will take the responsibility. I'll take the responsibility uh, to make sure that all beings are free from suffering, that all beings are the happy. So when we say that the the say that I will take the responsibility, the next question is how are you going to take the responsibility? Okay. So when you when you come, so these are the, the steps, extremely they're systematic. So first. <clears throat> and the say, um, the you feel the special rec recollection of the kindness of all the beings, and then um, you feel that okay, the so these beings are so beneficial, so kind to me. So the then your mind automatically flows towards them. There is love and affection. So with this, when you see the plight of the beings as suffering, as devoid of happiness, you wish that they are free from suffering that they have happiness, compassion, and loving kindness. So this is not explicitly presented in the nine steps. This is the implicit step in between the, the special recollection of the kindness of others and altruism. The implicit, uh, the, the step. So this must be included here. So with this, then the next is that, who will do it? May you be free from suffering. May all beings have the happiness. But who will do it? I will do it. That is altruism. I will do it. And the next question is, how are you going to do it? So when you say, I will do it, we have to make a commitment, not just, okay, now is the altruism, to take the responsibility. No, just mentally feel that. I will take the responsibility that all beings are free from suffering, that all beings are endowed with happiness. On what ground? On the ground that they are so, so, so beneficial and kind to me. Come to me to give me everything, to give me the short-term benefit, small scale, large scale, short-term benefit, to give me the lasting benefit, Nirvana Buddhahood. So they give me this, my self-centered attitude never give me anything good. It only pulls me down into miseries. So these beings are the ones who provide. Without them, I cannot have any of these benefits. So it is them that so because when you feel that <clears throat> you receive so much benefit from them, your mind automatically flows. That is love and affection, manifesting in the form of compassion and kindness. And then I must help them. I must, I may, I must, I must take the responsibility to help these other beings to be free from suffering that they've been down to happiness. I must take the responsibility. So make a very strong commitment that I will take the responsibility. And say in your own capacity, say for example, you are here in Tosamling Nunnery, 
and uh, the say in your own capacity just see how to make things easy for the community how to make things people are people inside that people are more friendly if you know the little let's say hardship is going with, with somebody you jump there to help this person and same of course we need a lot of skill particularly the bigger the community more the skill you require to help the community and to make the people gel with each other and uh, likewise say in your own family say so usually you expect your mother to give me or give me tea food and so forth now you take the initiative you take the initiative uh, to do this and and sometimes when the mother feels happy that mother uh, the does it to you let her do it but that's mostly you do it take the initiative so these are all part of the altruism alter the responsibility and then of course we need quite a lot of skills at workplace particularly in the corporate world the tendency is that somebody always tries to pull you down so that you know other person gets promotion or um, but like this all these nasty practices are there but this these are all the indications of the weakness of the weakness and the vulnerabilities of other people so when you reach to, to that level of compassion instead of feeling angry you will feel them so vulnerable you feel compassionate so this is where uh, this is how we can where our compassion can, can grow so taking the responsibility in your own capacity where on the um where say the um, the counter say the uh, where things can go counter productive you should be a little skillful otherwise just take the initiative take the responsibility to make things easier for your family members for your the, the community members when your workplace and so forth in for taking care of the say the vegetations environment Say so you go out in the forest, you are eating banana, you are eating some candies, and the the garbage you just throw it like this. Even in the streets, you know, through from the the car window you just throw water that you drink, the the bottle that you throw from the windows. No, don't do that. Take responsibility for the environment. Environment and being vegetarian, turning towards vegetarianism. And so like this, just take the responsibility. So don't expect, okay, when you take the responsibilities, again, the self-centered attitude is extreme, extreme, extremely cunning, extremely cunning self-centered attitude. So when you do something good for others, for environment, so forth, and then self-centered attitude is asking you to do for credit. You must get you know, some credit. The recognition from other people right and then oh i did this much to you i did this much to this person this person so shameless uh, not you know the when i'm difficulty the person not having me right your expectation this expectation is triggered within you by the self-centered attitude again the self-centered while you do something good for others to diminish self-centered self come out comes out in a very smart way to again deceive you Make, to make you to feel the expectation in return for what you've done. And then when people don't they return your, uh, the, say, the, 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 the works or your congestions, then you become angry, agitated, they are shameless people. This is all because of expectation. What makes you have the expectation? This expectation just destroys your virtuous karma. It damages your virtuous karma, and it may, immediately it makes you unhappy. Just if you are, if you don't, just imagine if you don't have the expectation. If you don't have the expectation, when the other person does not reciprocate to you for the good justice that you have done, and you will not be in pain, you will not be irritated. It's fine. So I did it. The, my job is done, and the other person do not they return it to me. It's fine because you don't have the expectation. So that way, the virtue that you did is not damaged and that you are not agitated. And this agitation, nobody wants it. Who may, the, what creates agitation? Agi expectation. What makes agitation? Self-centered attitude. It is so, so, so devious.
self-centered attitude. So this is how we have to reflect on the demands of the self-centered attitude. To the, what I share with you, on top of that, you just add your own experiences, which tell you the reality. <clears throat> okay, so with this, then the next question is, when you take this responsibility, I'll take the responsibility, mentally you try to feel it, verbally try to say this, say this, I'll take the responsibility, and then once in a while you can also evaluate if you're actually taking, if you actually have the tendency to take responsibility, right? And when you do remember the incidents where you take initiative to help others, you take initiative, rejoice, rejoice, oh yes, I did it. So then the, somebody, somebody was lost and the, um, the, if I go to spend a little time to help the person, I'm going to miss this and that, but I sacrifice my thing and I went there to have the person and I took the initiative. Oh, I did it. I'm so happy. Feel the joy. When you feel the joy, you feel like doing it again. So this is how we have to build the strength of the, uh, the, the altruism. Good. The next question is how are you going to do? How are you going to do? How are you going to make sure that you're going to help all other beings? For that, if you look at the history of the humanity, if you look at the history of humanity, for this, of course, when you speak about the history of the humanity, for this, you need to have a good picture of the teachings of Buddha. In other words, the good picture of the benefit of Bodhicitta, the good picture, the picture of the, the power of the wisdom of emptiness, the four seals, and so forth. When you get a comprehensive picture of the benefit, the very prof the profundity of the practice of the, the Buddhist teachings, then you will see that in the history of humanity, there was one Prince Siddhartha. And who succeeded in this journey to benefit all the beings? Just look at this, the legacy that he left, that the, the, the treasure that he left, the incredibly precious treasure, a great legacy for the, the for all the sentient beings. You just see this, this has the capacity to take me to fearlessness. This has the capacity to take me to infinite happiness. This has the capacity to take all of us to these two states. How come they succeed in this, this question? So, the two lines said by Acharya Dignaga, the one who has transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism motivated by to benefit all sentient beings, the teacher, Sugata, protector to your frustrations. These two lines on this basis, the one who has transformed, meaning somebody who was as ordinary prince, the prince, from there he transformed into the reliable guide to lead all the beings towards fearlessness and infinite happiness. How did he transform? Or was he the God right from the beginning? No, he was not a God. He was ordinary person like us, and then he transformed into the reliable guide. Wow. If this is how he did, I can also do that. I'm an ordinary person now. I also have the Buddha nature. I can also be transformed. Yes. So I must become one like him. What is that? May I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. That is Bodhicitta. Okay. So why should you become Buddha to benefit all the beings? Why should you become Buddha? In what way it helps? For this, we need to know that the best way, for example, let me, um, tell me honestly, there are so many ways of helping others. For example, today, if when Sambhala, when was when was the Sambhala, if she levitates two feet in the air, or sit there in the air for two for two minutes like this, there's going to be traffic jam. The next day, travelism, everything will come on the BBC. And the government will take initiative to raise, make a road. <laughs> make a road here. You don't have to take any initiative. Government will take the, the initiative. And all markets will come. Right? Just leave it for, for two minutes. When it will be leave it for two minutes. Traffic jam will happen, believe it or not. Right? Okay, now tell me. And then everybody will talk about a nun levitating in the air, right? And BBC will cover everything. What is that? What is that? BBC and CNN will cover. 
all these and the hashtag, <laughs> right? And, and the, what is this? NGTV. Hey, all the televisions will cover this, right? And there's going to be traffic jam, believe it or not. In one week, there's going to be the road, Paka road, <laughs> full road coming here, right at the Gomba. <clears throat> tell me, tell me. All these people will spend so much money to come here. And what will they get? Tell me. What will they get? All these people, what will they get? They will get, wow. That's it. And they will return. <laughs> right? They get, wow. And this wow will never fill the belly. The wow will not give them more education. The wow will not take them to fearlessness. The wow will not throw them to infinite happiness. Nothing. It's the same person in the home. They will continue to fight with the parents, continue to, to, to fight with the husband, wife, children. Right? Nothing is there. But there's going to be traffic jam. You're getting it? This one way of benefiting beings. Another way is by giving food. Another way is giving money, giving shelter, giving directions and so forth. So what do you think is the best way by which to benefit other beings? Anyone? Best way to get benefit other beings. Dharma, to give dharma, give, to give teachings. It's because of this that Buddha performed such miracles, levitations, all these things Buddha performed. Arya Nagarjuna never praised the Buddha for levitating in the air. <clears throat> Arya Nagarjuna praised the Buddha for giving teachings on emptiness and dependent origination out of compassion. And teach by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel the perverted views to you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Who is that? Who said it? Arya Nagarjuna said it. Enthused by great compassion. You are actually moved by great compassion. Your quality of compassion is amazing. And that made you to teach the Dharma. To dispel the perverted views, the wrong views, which trap the beings in samsara. To you, the Buddha I be homage. This is how the wise people see the goodness and the qualities in somebody else. Quality of compassion and the quality of wisdom. Okay, so we see that the best says the best way by which to benefit the beings is by giving teachings. And to give the teachings, the teachings the most effective way, you need three qualities. Perfect love, perfect, okay, perfect knowledge, perfect love, and the perfect power. These three qualities are required for you to be most effectively giving the teachings to other beings, to benefit the beings, free the beings from miseries and take them to ultimate happiness. We call this required. But the perfect knowledge, perfect love, and the perfect power. Okay, why these three qualities are required? The first one, perfect knowledge. <clears throat> Let us say that when you were a very young girl or a young boy in school, and um, the your father tells you that, hey, study well. If you study well, I'm always there to support you. I'm there to help you. And then one time, you have a science exam. You have a science exam. And then you remember your father's advice. Then you go to your father, uh, telling him that, oh my, look, my dad, my, the science exam is approaching within a week's time. So please teach me science. You promise to help me if I'm eager to, to study well. I'm now eager, very eager to study well. And the father said, I'm very sorry. I've been, I always failed in science when I was in school. How can you expect somebody to teach you science who always failed in science, right? So even your father, who's so keen to help you, could not help you. Why? What was, his, what was he lacking? He was lacking the knowledge. So in order to help somebody, you must have a thorough knowledge. Perfection knowledge is required. Then the father, what he said, okay, my daughter, my son, don't worry. Our next door neighbor is a professor in science, professor in physics. He can help you. And you can go there. And you go there, knock at the door, and the professor came out, the university professor came out. I said, hey, little girl, little boy, what do you want? So our 
they, my science exams are approaching within a week's time. This teaching science, 5,000 rupees per hour. 5,000 rupees is how many dollars? Hundred dollars, let's say, hundred dollars per hour, right? In America, there's a five hundred, five thousand, uh, five hundred dollars per hour. Can you pay this? Five hundred is very expensive, even by American standard, very expensive. Five hundred dollars per hour. You know that I'm not a school teacher. I'm a university <laughs> professor, and I'm a Nobel laureate in physics, <laughs> right? <laughs> so my charge is going to be more, right? Five thousand rupees per hour. Okay, so you cannot pay this much money, you go back to your father. So even the professor could not help you. How, why he could not help you? Because he's lacking love. Your father will never ask for 5,000 rupees. Your, your mom will never ask for 5,000 rupees for one hour teaching. Then, oh, then your father said, I'm very sorry. And said, okay, don't worry. Your mother, although she is not a professor in science, but when she was in school, she was a topper in science. She was in school, she was a topper in science. And when your mother comes back in the evening, like four o'clock, five o'clock, you would request her. So she has knowledge and she loves you. Then she comes and you jump to the mother as a mother, mom, teach me science. The mother, please stay away from me. The mother went for a conference. For a conference, she ate some steel food and she has a diarrhea problem, <laughs> right? So she has the knowledge and she, she loves you, but she cannot help you because she does not have the power to help you. So in order for somebody to help you most effectively in giving teachings, should have the perfect power. So when will you be equipped with these three perfections? When your Buddha nature becomes manifest fully, that is the state you are a Buddha. So when you become a Buddha, when a Buddha nature becomes manifest completely, at that point, you are endowed with three perfect qualities. Being perfect, being endowed with three perfect qualities, you are in a position to benefit all the sentient beings instantly. The question is, by why the Buddha became Buddha 2,500 years ago, still? So many people are suffering. You couldn't bend all the beings. So let's not forget this. There, um, the Arimatriya, in, in his text, Abhisamanakara, he put it so beautifully. It's a very beautiful, the poetic metaphor. So he said that the God of the rains, the God of the rains shower the rain equally to all the places. Where there's a seed will germinate into a sprout. Where there's no seed, no matter how much the rain comes, no crop will germinate. You getting you understand what is being said? So the Buddha is like shoving the rain without any partiality. To everywhere in the same everywhere in that the, the plot of land. But where there's a seed there will germinate and give give rise to the crop. Where there's no seed, no crop will grow. So where are the beings? So when I say the benefit of beings, it is, uh, it is again like the, the, the two hands coming together. The Buddha's blessings, the Buddha's power, and your karma. Two together, then the benefit comes into being. Where the Buddha's blessings are there, your karma is not there. No sound, no sound of the benefit. So, that in order for, for us to receive the benefit from the Buddhas, Buddhas, we have to make sure that our negative karmas are mitigated. And from our side, we should make some preparation. Like study the Dharma to the best you can, practice the Dharma to the best you can. Then, at a certain point, you will see that the Buddha's blessings are actually the showering on you like rain. Right? Okay. So, uh, it's because of this that the great masters, they say that, all the good things that we experience, somehow they're influenced by the Buddha's blessings. For us, you go out and you feel so hot at one point, you go out, you could feel the breeze there, even the breeze that you feel is the blessings of the Buddha is there. Of course, your karma is there. Your karma is there. 
and the Buddha's blessings there. Without the Buddha's blessings, you are not to, you, are not, you will not. For example, let's say that the, who are the two children of Obama? Sasha, Sasha and? Malia. Malia. Mali? Malia. Malia. Okay, let's say Sasha and Malia. Sasha and Malia existed before the Obama became the president. Yes? yes. They existed already. Yes. Nobody heard, heard of them. The moment the father became the president, they were just heard all over the world. Sasha, Maria, Sasha, Maria, right? Even the, the little, little girls, they mimic themselves as Sasha. And somebody mimic them as the Maria, right? Only after the father became the president. You're getting it? So therefore, the point is that, so where this, these two girls have already existed before he became the president. But... The benefit they, they got, the moment the fathers upgraded to the presidentship, they got the benefit. It's just multi, they multiplied by millions of times. So likewise, same, although we have the karma, because of the lessons of the, the Buddha, then the, the, this karma, the benefit simply multiplies. <clears throat> Even the, say, the very tiny say, breeze that you feel, or in the winter, very terribly cold winter, you are in a very cozy bed, you feel this joy. And you enjoy the cheesecake. So there, there you feel this feeling of joy. Every piece of the joy that you experience, there's a blessing from Buddha there. Same, I remember one very interesting anecdote. <clears throat> um, no, this is the, 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 and then, how do you know that? I don't see any Buddha giving me the blessing like this, right? And Buddha's blessings oftentimes where you don't, because the Buddhas don't have any expectations from you, right? Sometimes you, somebody, somebody does something so good to you and the person appears before you, I did it for you, right? Expectations there. But the Buddhas have never expectations. It's like the mother's love, right? Mother's love. And not all mothers, but majority of mothers, 80, 90 percent of mothers, they don't have expectation from the child. They simply want the child to be, to be happy and good. This is exactly the, the Buddha's love. So I remember this is the, 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 what I'm sharing with you now. This is what very clearly demonstrated by one of my friends, and um, the he was from an extremely humble family, extremely poor family. And the, his father and the father's brothers, two or three brothers there, and sisters there, and his wife, his mother was there, and then the, the, he has several siblings there, three, four, I think four or five siblings there. Huge family, and very poor, and gradually, eventually, uh, the, he somehow got in the village, in a, the very simple poor village. Somehow he, uh, he got uh, some, what, some decent, decent work. He became like the, a small mayor in a tiny village. And then from there he, he, he still got further promotion. And his uncle. And all the family members were still very poor. And he was uncle, his uncle was driving a small motorbike. And the motorbike, you have to put fuel in it, gas in it. And the, the motorbike, in motorbike, the gas, how much, this petrol, the, how many liters can go in? Anyone? Any idea? Huh? Three liters? Three and a half liters? Huh? Five to seven. Okay, five, some says five to seven. This must bullet, bullet, the, the Ninjala must be driving the bullet, right? And maybe the tuna. Lakshmi must be driving the tuna, the small one, <coughs> right? So let's say the three, three and a half liters, let's say three and a half liters. And this uncle, he would buy. How much of the, how much of the, uh, the, the, what, uh, the patrol? Like this. He would buy like this much for two rupees. In those days, two rupees this much, 
this much. Actually, it has capacity to be minimum by three liters. But he would buy because he, he did not have money. And he lived like this for all these years, so poor. So he did not dare to spend so much. And then this gentleman, now the uncle's nephew, he came to know about this. So what he did was that he went to the petrol pump and told the person that when my uncle, who always comes to ask for this much of, lead, this much of petrol, when he comes, what you do, do one thing. You keep a register and when he, when he says, okay, give me petrol, just fill his tank full. Fill his tank full. And if he pays you one rupee, take it. If he pays you two rupees, take it. But make sure that you fill his tank full. And then the whatever the petrol that you gave, keep it in the register. On this date, I give two liters. I give which is like, let's say two liters, like 60 rupees in those, let's say 40 rupees. And he bought petrol for only two rupees. And he got petrol of 60 rupees, right? So keep a register. And then after one month, they give the bill to me. I'll pay you. But don't tell my uncle that I'll pay, right? If, they, if he asks you, but I paid you two rupees, is, is this what I get for two rupees? The whole tank full of the, the petrol? You just say yes, right? And the uncle did not know that. The uncle was so fascinated. How come my, the, the, I can drive this very freely for the, the whole one week for two rupees? The whole one week and the petrol never goes away. And he discovered that they are giving him the full petrol. He was so fascinated. How come? It must be a blessing of the gods. And then he asked them, right? I just give you two rupees. Is this for two rupees? Yes. Two rupees. He never knew. He never knew that it was all coming from his, the, the, from his nephew, right? So this is how the Buddha's blessings are what we receive. Without you knowing that it's the Buddha who's actually giving us, showering his blessings, that we get this happiness. Every small bit of the happiness that we get, small to the big, they're all related to the Buddha's blessings. Like this, you know, the nephew, Maintaining very the maintaining the anonymity and making sure that the uncles is benefited. Okay, so that is the the say when you become Buddha, you will be endowed with three perfect qualities: perfect knowledge, perfect love, and perfect power. Pinzoli. <coughs> Bodhisattvas, they don't have the three perfections, they have the three qualities. They have the three qualities, love, knowledge, and power, but they don't have the perfection of the love, perfection of the uh, knowledge, and the perfection of the power. So Bodhisattvas, they're struggling to get the perfection of these three, so that they can most effectively benefit all the beings. <coughs> Ability, exactly. Ability and the potential. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, the the bodhicitta bodhicitta practice on the basis of the method of realizing existence of others. Next is what bodhicitta practice on the basis of the sevenfold cause effect method. So this method is what who inherited this teaching from the Buddha. Arimetria. Arimetria and Arimetria passed down this to Aryasanga. Then Aryasanga passed down to his younger brother Acharya Vazubandhu. Okay, this is how we is transmitted and finally it was uh, passed down to Lama Selimpani in Indonesia and then to Lama Atisha Dibangar Shirikyana and then to brought, Lama Atisha brought this to Tibet and this is how this teaching remains so alive till today. Okay, and for information about this, the method of equalizing and exchanges of others, um, the, you, you do find the mention of this in Arinigarjuna's text also, but more systematically you find in 
the Bodhisattva Shanti Devas text, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, chapter 8. Chapter 8. But when I say systematic, it doesn't mean that how I put the step, nine steps. No. With nine steps, you have to know what the nine steps are. And to, to supplement, to enrich these nine steps, you take from what the Bodhisattva Shanti Deva taught in chapter 8. Okay. And the reasons that he employed, he gives the, the extreme, extremely sharp, extremely sharp reasons, the, the cognitive trans, the transformation. If you understand what he's saying, cognitive trans, the transformation is must. It will automatically happen. So when you see that your compassion is exponentially uh, growing, you'll see that. Okay. So therefore, uh, the we should we should be wise enough to know that to bring about spiritual transformation, particularly going towards the Buddhahood. And if your goal is just to maintain a calm, peace mind, peaceful mind, you have no idea about Buddhahood or the, the fearlessness nirvana. And if your job is just you want a peace of mind, then single point meditation is fine. You do some single point breathing meditation, that's fine. Whereas if you want to just see that the anger subsides, anger subsides, if this is what you want, then well, Buddhahood, okay, I don't know what it is, Nirvana, I don't know, but at least there's so much anger there. With my anger, I can see the immunity goes down, and then there's so much health issues. Yes, anger can really give rise to so much of health hazards. I've seen that with my own eyes. Anger can really destroy your immunity, and which, because of that lack of immunity, you can just end up into all forms of health issues, health hazards. I've seen that with my own eyes. So anger must be dealt with. And some people, some smart doctors, they will advise the, the patients, instead of extracting, continuously extracting money from the patient, would be so genuine and tell the patient that stop your anger, otherwise this is going to kill you, right? Otherwise, let him have more anger, the doctor can extract more money, continues to extract more money from him. But some doctors are so kind. They will say to them, stop your anger. Stop your anger, otherwise this anger will kill you. Okay, so uh, the, um, if this is your endeavor to stop the anger, then practice bodhicitta. You know, and if you're a little intelligent, if you're interested in the wisdom and emptiness, oh. then these two will help you to remove the anger. But if you want to, to go for the infinite happiness, Buddhahood or Nirvana, it must be a complete practice. Renunciation, Bodhicitta, wisdom of emptiness, and the single point meditation. All are required, not one partially. You're getting it? This is so important. Okay. Now the sevenfold cause effect method. Sevenfold cause effect. Yes, Abhishekji. Yes. The two two aspirations. One is to practical aspect of reducing anger. The practical aspect which you mentioned of reducing anger by practicing is the awareness. And the second aspect is to achieve fearlessness or absolute happiness. And the aspirations and the efforts are um, in, not in sync. Do you think if I'm, someone is aspiring to Buddha for the Nirvana and not to feel it, will that elevate the anger? And can that also happen? That we will actually. Okay, I couldn't follow you completely. Say it again. Say to remove the anger. Yeah. I said that the two aspects one, build your compassion. There's one aspiration. One aspiration. To Yes. And if you're aspiring for that, and if you're unable to achieve, or if you're failing, and, uh, or uh, not being able to put all the effort, would that again result in increasing the frustration and anger? Okay, that's interesting. Say so you are you are thinking of attaining Buddhahood in Nirvana, and the and you find that it's not happening, and the, so you aspire for that. The more you aspire that. The less you accomplish it, the more the anger arises. Is it possible? This question. Okay, so this morning, I said we should be realistic. 
which is, um, what is it? We should be as a as a long journey. Long journey means you should be well prepared. You should have the proper road map. You should have the proper road map, and you have to know what are the potential dangers, shortcomings, threats that can come on the way. And you should be ready with what remedies to apply when this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. Then you should have the remedies ready. Because this is a very good journey. It's not like a small child's journey. It's a very important journey. Okay. So with this, the point is that uh, one of the dangers, particularly with the people from the modern education, modern education, modern education itself is designed in to accomplish something in this life. So subconsciously we are like indoctrinated to say that what do you do result must be seen in this life ultimate result final result must be seen in this life no modern education is designed for you to attain uh, say the better um, the uh, meaningful life the next life no modern education is designed that way so because of which our mind is shaped in ways to look for something, the result, ultimate result, just in this life, and possible within 10 lives, with maximum like 10 years. And people who can think longer than 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, usually they become extremely good strategists of the, the nation, the, the thinkers, think tanks. People in think tank, these are the people who are being identified by the the bigger people that these people can help the nation to build the nation or you are put in a group of called as the think, think tank who can think who can think of the policies for the nation 20 years policy 100 years policy and 200 years policy 300 years policy so these most of the people they are not trained like this only a few people perhaps from the past lives they have this mindset and these can think of from a very global from a, the say uh, the, the wide range of in the from the point of perspective of the wide range of time and space they think of this so these people they can become like the uh, the the policy makers and um, be in the think tank so whereas the most of ordinary people they just want the result right away right so this morning we we discuss it renunciation four seals i'll meditate for one month one month renunciation is fine then bodhicitta he said it will take longer okay two months bodhicitta then the wisdom emptiness and that i'll not eat food just what is fine or some maggie is fine maggie instant noodle is fine right so that i, I save my time then the wisdom emptiness he said many studies okay let's say three months and then what? Single point of meditation. Or single point of meditation, it doesn't require so much studies, just observe the breath. Right? One month is enough. So total how many months? Nine months. Nine months. And then what? Then Gade Gade is already there. Then Paragade, nothing to do. Just continue with this practice. Then Paragade, Parasamgade, Bodhisattva, right? Then Buddhahood. Before one year, Buddhahood. <laughs> and then before Buddhahood, in two weeks you drop everything, right? This is because you are being very unrealistic. You are being very unrealistic. You think that your car is a Rolls Royce car. Actually, your car is a very a 20 years old car, 20 years old car, and you are using this car in order to run like 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers per hour. This is what you're thinking. Very unreal. Your mind is like the like a very crude car, very simple car, that to like 20 years old car, right? With uh, the what? What is the mileage? A quarter of a kilometer per liter. Per liter, quarter of a kilometer. That to like tuk 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 tuk, right? The, what is the speed? 10 kilometers per hour. And this is, this is the car that you're using and expecting to reach the reach the, the sun in one year or in a in few months you reach the sun day this is totally unrealistic you're getting it so what we do is that 
But this card is, although it's very crude, simple card, but you can use the same card and make it Rolls Royce. You don't buy Rolls Royce from outside. Right? This card is, but this uniqueness of this card is that it can become Rolls Royce if you tackle it nicely. Right? How? First work on, first work on, first work on, Consistency. First book on consistency is small, small, start small. Focus on consistency. Don't focus on the quality, don't focus on the quantity, focus on the consistency. And if you can prove that you're consistent for one year, two years, the only then I will say that you are serious. I'll not say you are successful. I'll say you are serious. Only if you are serious, I will, I will then suggest you to go for the quality. Go for the rigor. Consistency and the rigor. First, we're going to consistency. You have to prove that first. One year, two years. Even for modern education. Even to become a professor. Even to complete your PhD. You have to minimum spend like... 16 years, 16, 17, 18 years, minimum. Just for PhD, you have to minimum 16, 17. How can you expect to attain Buddhahood within one year, two years, three years? Even for mundane PhD, you need to spend 16 years. That was the prime of your life. So how can we expect to become Buddha within like one year, two years? How can we be impatient? We should be very realistic. Okay, so first focus on the consistency for one two years if you're consistent with this then i will pass you as successful practitioner no as a serious practitioner then i will ask you to work on your rigor you're getting it this is how we have to grow this is how to work okay so with this the next is the the sevenfold cause effect method to gen bodhicitta <clears throat> Okay, for the sevenfold cause of the method for general bodhicitta, first let us enumerate what the seven are. Okay, ready? The first is remembering all beings as one's mothers. Remembering all beings as one's mothers. Number two, remembering their kindness. Remembering the kindness. Number three, repaying the kindness. Repaying the kindness. Next is number four, seeing the beings in the light of great affection. Seeing the beings in the light of great affection. Number four. Number five, great compassion. Great compassion. Number six, altruism. And number seven, bodhicitta. Okay, number one, remembering all beings of one's mothers. Number two, remembering their kindness. Number three, repaying their kindness. Number four, seeing beings in the light of great affection. Number five, great compassion. Number six, altruism. Number seven, bodhicitta. Okay, remembering all beings as one's mothers, what is number two? <laughs> remembering the kindness, what is number three? Yeah. Repaying the kindness, what is number four? Yeah. Uh, seeing the beings in the light of great affection, what is number five? Yeah. Great compassion, what is number six? Yeah. Altruism, what is number seven? Yeah. Bodhicitta, good. Okay. The first is seeing beings and uh, the, the remembering all beings as one's mothers. Um, okay, the um, if so, most of us this practice can go well for us, but some of us, one out of ten thousand people, or one out of 1,000 people may find the first step not so acceptable. 
uh, where, who is that? Somebody and they, um, who, did not, who did not get this love and affection from the mother at your early age. Early age meaning when you're born. Age one, age two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, the the mother, you know, the mother might might have been somebody who, um, the who had a very difficult childhood herself, and not knowing how to give love and affection. That is one. And then some of the mothers having mental problems. Mental problems meaning, say like what schizophrenia and so forth. Then how can you blame the mother? The mother herself is in such a pathetic situation, vulnerable situation. When you are suffering from the schizophrenia, you can't expect to give love and affection because this, you have to live in fear every moment. And so of course, it's a self. It's a, the. It's, it's like a, the self-created. It's not really a fear from outside, but of the, out of the disease that you feel this fear. Uh, how can I expect to give love to somebody else? So whereas I would say 90, 99% of the people, uh, the, you will not find difficulty with this practice. And, but you may say that, no, I don't agree because I have a difficulty with my mother. That must be after you after you reaching age 14, 15, 16, 17, not before that. If you have no issue before age 10 or before age 11, I would say that you can practice as well. And if you st still think that you cannot, uh, this indication that we are ordinary beings. Simply because we have a minor differences when you become more self-sufficient, self age-wise, age 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, then the friction is built up between you and mother. Not because that the mother is unkind, it's because that the mother loves you so much and the mother doesn't want you to go into a bad um, the situation. And then you, because you are truly inexperienced, you can easily end up into bad situation. You can end up into dangerous. And you don't think that is danger. You see it as, um, you know, say a very happy moment. Actually, it can be a very dangerous situation, which your mother and father could see. When they try to stop you, you were very angry towards your mother and your father. So, whereas at the age of like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, if you have no issue with your mother, you are the person, you are the fit to practice this. Okay, remember all beings as one one's mother. But the Buddha very clearly indicated it's not that you can do this practice only if only related to your mother, not necessary. Whereas if you genuinely feel more loving and affection towards affection towards your father, grandmother, grandma, grandma, the grandfather, or you know anybody to whom you genuinely feel. And somebody is extremely kind, who is really selflessly there for you, right? Genuinely, this is a key keyword. Genuinely, otherwise, uh, we say so oftentimes when we meet somebody initially, you see the other person like a god. Other person gives you the full, you know, will be, you have the hundred percent freedom. Other person gives you hundred percent freedom. You get two hundred percent freedom. That is for one week or two weeks. Right, and then after that you lose your freedom. This is what happens. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, younger ones still you may not understand. Right? Okay. So you lose. So first you get two hundred. First, look at this. This is the marketing. Right? This is how the marketing is done. Right? When you first set up a restaurant. The food which otherwise costs you like say 1000 rupees, you will get for 200 rupees. Wow, it's so cheap, so good food, everybody goes there, right? And then the, then the price shoots up to 2000 rupees, right? Okay, and then you already trap there, and the people who sell it the SIM cards. It's a free SIM card. Free SIM card. Not a free SIM card, you also have a, what? The 200 rupees free talk time. Wow, that's amazing. You don't have to pay anything. You get the SIM card free. And then there you can talk, talk time, 200 rupees, 500 rupees free. And that too, free for three months, sometimes. Sometimes free for, free for one year. Wow, that's amazing. Everybody buys this. 
and then you cut off from all the other connectivities. Then it becomes monopoly, right? And then it shoots up, right? You have to pay. Then pay what? Whatever they charge you, you have to pay this. Now the switch is very difficult to see something else. This is the marketing strategy, right? This is exactly what is happening in a private life, right? First you get 200 freedom. First you have 100. And then the other person comes, they give you 200. That's amazing. Initially, both, of, both sides get 200. That's amazing. I don't know where this extra 200 is coming. Both sides get 200. Actually, 100 and 100. If 200 means one person should get 200 and the other person should get zero. No, both get 200. Because, he, right? Same the Hey, I have a little headache. Would you mind getting the medicine from this two kilometers? Yes, I'll go there. <laughs> right? To, going there is a joy. <laughs> going there is a joy. <laughs> then later on, at the next door, can you get the water the, from the kitchen? Why can't you do it? <laughs> right? <laughs> after two weeks, after three weeks, after one month, then the <laughs> then you lose year, then you lose your fifty percent. Right? Okay. So the point is that it is not necessary. This is what I meant by genuine. Generally speaking, the mothers, they will continue to worry with the child. Generally speaking, not with everyone, but the majority, like 60%, 70% of the mothers, they continue to worry, worry, worry about you. You're not studying well, they wish that you study well. You are an alcoholic, they wish that oh, you don't study, it's fine. You don't work at all. But stop the alcohol. And when you stop alcohol, at least study something. Right? You don't have to work, study something. You eat well. Right? And then you eat well, just read books. No, do something. <laughs> right? And you do good. Right? Look at that person, that's a CEO. You can also become a CEO, right? And then go to another person, my son is very good, my daughter is very good, right? You become a CEO. And when you become a CEO, again, she's not, again, she has another aspiration, right? Right? You should run two companies, right? <laughs> Three companies. Eventually, you should become the, the minister of the, the commerce of the nation. And still, you should be happy if you become that. You should become the 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 what the rep the, the UNO general secretary, <laughs> right? So this is the, the mother's expression for you. Mother loves you so much that she wants the best thing for you. She will continue to worry about you even when you reach 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, right? She will continue to worry about you. This is the meaning of the genuine love and affection. Whereas who gives you 200% happiness, freedom, and then in two weeks you lose the you lose the 50%, that is not a genuine. You're getting it? Okay, so what I'm saying is that the Buddha very clearly indicated that anybody who gives you a genuine love and affection, you think of that person, not necessarily your mother, but if you feel your mother, in most cases, the mother is an ideal example. And particularly when you, the way in manner in which I told you, I shared the story with you, on the American, did I say the story here? Huh? Here in this class? Are you sure? Okay, I don't trust those people who did NDC, NMC, they got confused between the two classes, <laughs> including myself. Did I share? Did I share this here? Oh, those people, we have to ask those people who did not attend NDC and MC these classes about yes good okay good so the point is that if you if you think that you have problem with your mother I say the particularly if the problem is after when you reach age 14 15 16 17 not before that then you have to go back in time what you, when you were age 10 or age 12, 11, 10, 
and try to rem remember those episodes where your the say the uh, that your uh, there's a prospect of your mother for some business business meetings or business travels uh, that she had to made and then she had to leave you behind and then such the pain that comes to you because of your love for your mother. So just try to retreat those those experiences. Then you see that then slowly the deep in profound imprint of affection that you have. Uh, that you that you have left related to your mother, the love towards the mother, it will come more and more evidently on the surface. Then you will see your mother, you will see the mother very differently. At a certain point, you see the mother, is, you see the mother, you just feel some kind of corrosion, uneasiness there. And now when you go back in time, you treat this very profound the imprint of the love that you receive from the mother. Think of that more when you were vulnerable age 5, say 7, 8, 9, 10, think of this more, then this imprint will come manifestly on the surface. And then you see your mother, you see your mother is so beautiful and so nice. You feel this, the joy there in seeing your mother. It's so beautiful. You must try this. Okay. And the Buddha said, the, you, can, you know, you can think about your son, your daughter, your teacher, your say the the uncle, your auntie, you know, whosoever gives you a genuine affection, you think of that person. Okay, seeing being of the remember all beings as one's mother. This is just an example, and you can relate this to your father, brother, son, sister, whatever. Okay. So the question is that you in this life you have a mother. And in the, the in the formal life also you had a mother. In the form of formal life also you had a mother. So how many times you had a mother? Infinite number of times. For this question is, how do we know that there is a rebirth, there is a formal life? How do we know that? This is a big question. Okay, since that we don't have much time, I don't want to share all the stories, stories meaning my own anecdotes. My own the anecdotes of you know meeting with the scientists, physicists, talking about the river and so forth. I want to skip these stories there uh, to make it very quick. How do we account for the river? And uh, the for this river, I'm going to quickly share uh, some thoughts on this. Uh, one thing is that let's not begin by saying that there is rebirth. Let's begin by saying if there is rebirth. For example, let's say that I don't believe in the existence of the Creator God. But I cannot say that there's no Creator God. I will begin by saying that if there's a Creator God. You're getting it? If. Which means that I'm not saying it exists. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Likewise, we have to begin by saying that if there is rebirth. Which means we don't begin by... We don't begin by blindly accepting that the rebirth exists, we begin by an open question. Open question, whether or not rebirth exists. So for this, we begin by saying, if rebirth exists, how can we explain this? If rebirth exists. So, so which means that something within us should be going to the next, next life and should have come from the past life. If there is something within us. So what is that? If you look at us, we see that we only we have only two things. For example, you say that I'm Tibetan. Why? Because my body is Tibetan, right? And you say that okay, you are not. By the way, say the say when once I was in my forties. Once I'm at, how old I am is determined by body or my mind. My body, right? Okay, there are many stories. Give the stories away. So the, my age is determined by body, but not my not by my mind. Don't forget it. You're getting it. And then say the whether you're Tibetan, Indian, American, French, Swiss, all this is de determined by your body, not by your mind, right? Okay. Then how good are you? How kind are you? How intelligent are you? How angry you are? This is all determined by your mind, right? And taking, taking away these two things, the, the characteristic as the Dorji makes no sense. You know, I say that I, that's the empirical self, I. 
I want happiness. I don't want suffering. That's the empirical self I. And of course, some people, they believe in the non-empirical self. non -empirical self. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about whether such, you know, non-empirical, non something which we cannot experience right now. As ordinary people, we cannot experience that exists not. There's not that I'm going to touch in this area. I'm talking about the Dorji, that I have a direct access to myself, that I'm a, that I'm a male, I'm a Tibetan, the, I'm kind, I'm not kind, I'm intelligent, I'm not intelligent. This person that, that I describe myself, I see myself as empirically. That self. That self, we see that it is related to the body and the mind. That's it. If you take over the body, then I'm not a Tibetan. Then they, they, I don't have age if I take over my body. If my mind is taken away, then I'm not a sentient being. Then I don't have the feeling. I don't... They then the compassionate, not compassionate, the intelligent, not intelligent, they all make no sense. Which means that what I am, for example, let's say there's a table. Table makes sense only with the top length and the four legs. That's it. Removing the four legs and the, the, the top length, there's no table there. Likewise, you take out the body and my mind, there's nothing left there's the dorji. That's it. That's I'm talking about the empirical self. And the, the, beside this self, I don't accept, but I don't reject it. Right? Rejecting it means like is is about about the traditions. I don't want to reject any tradition. But what I accept is the empirical self. That this self which I can experience that I'm Tibetan, I'm a boy, I'm you know, I'm kind, I'm not kind, I'm intelligent, I'm not intelligent, I'm, I'm this age, I'm I'm not young. So this the the, the, the self which qualifies these descriptions. That is the self that I'm talking about. So this self, if this self has the reincarnation, meaning that this self moves from one life to the other, if it, if it does have this quality that it can move from one life to the other, then the, it should be within the bound of the, either the body or the mind. And the body is so fierce. Body, it doesn't go to the next birth, 100%. The body either is cremated or is buried or whatever, the, the body, has nothing to do with the next birth or but it doesn't really come from the past life it doesn't go to the next birth if at all something is there which travels to the next birth it's going to be your mind the mind okay the next question does the mind exist as separate from the body this next question does, does the mind exist as separate from the body particularly the brain does it exist as separate from the brain this next question so what's the correlation between the brain and the mind? This is a huge discussion, and for this, um, the, this is not that easy. It is not easy to prove rebirth. It is not. It is. It is not easy to prove rebirth. It is not easy to disprove rebirth. Let's not forget it. It is not easy to prove the rebirth. It is equally not easy to disprove rebirth. At the most, you can say that I don't see this. To say that there's no rebirth. At the most, you can say that I don't, I don't believe in it. That's it. Who saw it? But uh, to study quantum mechanics, the person should have a sharp intelligence. To study quantum mechanics, don't think that quantum mechanics is a cup of tea of everybody. It's not everybody can understand it. Niels Bohr said it, that if you study quantum mechanics, and, and if you're not shocked by it, you have not understood quantum mechanics yet. You're getting it? If you study quantum mechanics, and if you're not shocked by it, right? Right? Did you hear this? Niels Bohr said it, right? Our physicist here, a young physicist, how old? 19. 18, 19. 19 years old, 19 years of physicist, brilliant physicist. So if you don't believe in what I said, ask her. What Niels Bohr said is that if you study quantum mechanics and if you're not shocked by it, wow, <laughs> this film doesn't, goosebumps doesn't come to you, you have not understood quantum mechanics yet. You're getting it? So quantum mechanics is not a cup of tea of everyone. This is something to be understood by with intelligence. You must have enough intelligence to understand this. Likewise, rebirth is not something which anybody can easily understand. It requires a lot of intelligence. 
It requires a lot of intelligence to see the nuances of the high, how the mind works and to see the nuances of the nuances of the correlations between the brain and the mind. Only then you can talk about the rebirth, whether or not it exists. Okay, this is a very sophisticated topic. So with this, what I'd like to share with you is that the, the, if there is something which travels to the next birth, it should be the mind. The next question is, does this mind exist as different from the brain? You cannot easily say no. You cannot say easily say yes. You cannot easily say this. Because it requires a lot of intelligence to say yes or no. Okay, for this, or for example, let's say, some, some points that I'll raise here. One is that, let's say that, the, um, let's say that the, uh, the, what is the most sophisticated mobile now? <laughs> huh? Brand new Apple iPhone 14 Pro, right? So this, this iPhone, does it, does it operate on its own? In the morning, right? Hey! Right? Hey, Philip, get up, it's time for, right? Hey, Philip, it's time for your, uh, the, uh, for your breakfast. Hey, now it's your time for your class, right? Hey, Alexi, don't disturb me. Alexa, 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 don't disturb me, right? Then Alexa, okay, sorry, <laughs> right? Okay, sorry. Right. Okay. Do you agree with me? This Alexa, you have to first of all put everything there, set up everything there. Who 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 set that up? You. The company will make the the main design and your voice, and particularly if you are very particular that this Alexa is not misused by your neighbor. You have to teach Alexa your voice. That your neighbor, you know, Alexa will ignore the voice of the, your neighbor. Otherwise, right, Alexa open the door, Alexa opens, tuck, tuck, open the door, and the neighbor from outside said, Alexa open the door, Alexa open the door, <laughs> right? The Alexa will not say, you are my neighbor, you are not my, you are not my boss. Right, at least open the door. So you have to, to set that. If if I say open the door, Alexa should not know this. Right? You set it in such a way that Alexa, Alexa does not respond to your voice when you said open the door. Otherwise, your neighbor will say open the door and Alexa will open the door. And then the thief will say open the door, open the door. You're gonna get all these are problems because. Alexa needs external operator. You're getting it? However sophisticated Alexa is, however efficient Alexa is, it requires external operator. Whereas who's operating on you? Somebody comes in the morning, press a button in you, and then you start operating. Or who operates on you? You don't need external operator. You're getting it? What is that? Your brain is like a mechanical, purely mechanical, like Alexa. But you don't need extra, the extra operator. That's a mind that operates on you. Right? So operator and what is operated, these two cannot be same. Right? Alexa and you, you are not same. You are not Alexa. Yeah, you are the operator of the Alexa. Your mind is operator. Operator and operated, these two cannot be same. So these are the nuances. You cannot say that, right away say that these two are different. These two are one. You cannot say like this. You have this. You need to have these eyes to see the nuances. You need to have this. You need to have this the sharp intelligence to see the nuances. And say so anything that I will share with you is that the same. You have a sense of I, a sense of I. This person, this I, sense of I. And this was a sense of I. When you were five years old, when you were ten years old, when you today, all alone, you have the sense of I. Yes? You have the sense of I. 
Okay. But if it's purely the brain, if it's purely the physical body, right? Physical body, we see that when you were just a, a tiny fetus in the mother's womb, how many cells are there? There may be like a few million cells, that's it. Now you have trillions of cells within you, right? And of these millions of cells with which you came in the mother's womb, many of these already died. New cells already came up. And there's no sense of new self. Now I'm a different person. No, it's the same person. Although the body is almost like, almost like 90% of the body that you have now was totally non-existent when you were a tiny child. Nine, minimum 90% of your body that even now was totally absent at the time of when you were a child. Because the cells die and new cells are grown. Only a few neurons, the neurons, their lifespan is long, and then that they, they die, it says that they don't, they say, they regenerate. But even nowadays, there's a discussion on neuroplasticity. You're getting it? Even now, they have these new developments coming up. The idea is that Say, the, if you equate the mind and the brain completely, just as the, the, there's a total change happening on the brain level, on the body level, there should be a total change happening in the sense of self. And then, you know, uh, then you, it is like, you know, yesterday you were a boy and today you were a girl. You, uh, yesterday you were at the say, Tibetan and today you were like American. Like a sense of this identity should change like this, but it never does it. So there's a constant sense of self, and yet this self is not illusion. This self is so important because of this self, you have the medical facilities, you have the, the, the say, education, you have the family, you have the, in the hospitals, in the hospitals, the psychiatry, the psychiatry, and all these facilities created for to <coughs> keep this self happy and to keep this self to stay away from the pains. You get it? This self is an empirical reality. It's not an illusion. And yet this self, if you equate the self marked by the body and the mind, if the mind and the body, these two are to be viewed as the one thing, then the danger is that the self becomes like either illusion or, say, with the change in the body, like 90% of your body that you had, like when you were a child, is no more there with you. So the sense of I should be 90% very different now. But this is not the case. Okay. And uh, the and also the, the another thing and the, the which a big debate that came up was about the free will. The free will. It was a it was a discussion in it was a discussion in a not discussion, a conference in Israel organized by a neuroscientist, a very renowned neuroscientist, and his group, his team. There were so many neuroscientists, his students were there, and psychologists were there, even physicists were there. And uh, the and the, the I was also invited there to give a talk on what is consciousness, what is mind from the Buddhist point of view. And there, that, 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 that conference, I would say that of all the conferences that I attended, that one I would say is the most, the, the best conference that I would say. Because there's a heated discussion happening, direct discussions, debates happening. Not like, you know, very diplomatic, you ask a question and the person gives the answers and even you're happy or not happy, you stop. No. So it's just a follow up question and answers happening. And it's a very heated uh, debates, like the debates that we have in the Manchester University, kind of that. And I was so impressed. So there, one neuroscientist was they talking about the, how the neurons work, how the brain works, related to the activity of the mind, mental activities. And then the, somehow it slipped into the, the topic on free will. And then from the audience, audience, the physicists were there, neuroscientists were there, psychologists were there, they were all pressing the, the presenter. And so 
how can you account for free will if you if you the reduce all the mental activities to the brain brain is purely purely physical material thing is a mechanical thing brain where the the brain is pure mechanical you should be able to identify where the free will is the free will means there's a possibility there's a choice there whereas if it's pure mechanical there's no choice for example there's some flowers here the sun rise the sun rises from the east there's no choice of the flower okay today i'll not face towards the sun there's no choice but it's a pure mechanical it'll turn towards the it will invariable turn towards the sun unless the branch is broken it'll turn towards the sun whereas you are a human being your mother is coming from behind hey my daughter okay shall i look at my mother or not you have the choice if it's purely mechanical you don't have the choice where is the free will this was the, the huge discussion and the neuroscientist she did not have any answer she could stuck the air right because she tried to explain something again the more questions come up more internal contradictions so this way if you reduce the functions of functions of the mind to the brain activities many contradictions are there it's not that easy to say that brain and mind is all one you're getting it okay so from this we see that and then the um, the most important thing is that the change of brain changes happen in the brain in the mind change the mind changes happen in the, the, the brain these two things many people think that brain and mind is the same because say brain damage happens then they say the your ability to speak stops your ability to think stops your ability to feel the empathy stops right you ability your ability to feel the you able to feel these that the pains stops so this was seen as one no so this is so beautifully explained by uh, the acharya dharmakirti a 7th century great indian master acharya dharmakirti in his text pramana vartika chapter 2 pramana vartika chapter 2 of course this is chapter 2 you have to study it you study with the help of a teacher it's not something that you read and you understand it it's not like a uh, say the novel reading a storybook it's like a study of quantum mechanics you have to learn from an expert without this you cannot understand it okay so, so can we say mind and brain are separate entities that influence each other? separate entities and they influence each other of course this is what I'm. This is what I'm. Um, what I'm sharing with you that Acharya Dharmakirti he so beautifully ex explained all these things. The mind and brain these two are mutually dependent on each other. Mutually dependent on each other. Yet these two are very distinct entities. Okay, this is so well explained there, and usually, oftentimes, even in public public addresses. You go to some center, some teachers are there, you ask about the river, they will tell stories. You know, somebody who remembers their past life and so forth. And I'm, I'm somebody who does not accept these stories, nor do I reject the stories. I'm very neutral to this. And when I explain rebirth, I don't really share stories. And only if somebody is interested, I can share stories, which I'm convinced of. Right. Otherwise, simply because I hear somebody from somebody, I don't share this to prove that this is a rebirth. No, this no, this is not from my point of view. This is not how it works. But some teachers they give you the reasons plus share the stories. This is amazing. For example, his holiness, he gives the reasons, then he shares the stories. This is so effective. Whereas many people they only tell share the stories, no reasons. It doesn't help. But intelligent people, they'll run away from you. you know, anybody can tell stories to say that I'm a Buddha. So I'm, uh, I'm a Buddha who is, who is with full of anger. Yeah, I can create stories. Yeah, I can kill, create stories. There's a Buddha who's full of anger, who's not enlightened, a Buddha who's not enlightened me. Right? You can make stories. So stories can go both ways. Whereas stories are there as examples. And the reasons must be there. So that's very important.
Ok, we'll stop here. Deata om gade gade Para gade Para sam gade bodhisvahatyata Om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi swahatyatam om gate gate para gate Para sangate bodhisattva. Okay, the, with regard to the stories, it is not that all stories are wrong, and nor is that all stories are true. So, I personally always keep the stories a little neutral, but there are many stories, very convincing stories are there. You cannot reject all stories. Simply because this story doesn't mean that it's wrong. This is my personal stand. And in fact, the what happened to me was that I was in Nigeria. One time I was in Nigeria and uh, the, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And then I had to go to the airport one hour in advance. No, two hours in advance. So the government, Nigerian government, sent a policeman to escort me to the airport. And um, then the policeman in a the civil dress, two of us and the driver, and they because the the to their part, it was like one hour, so we had so much time together. And he asked me, "Sir, tell me something about Buddhism." The policeman in a civil dress. And I shared about the Nirvana, Buddhahood, and emptiness. He was not at all interested. <laughs> and why? why? You know, why do you want to listen about it if you're not interested? <laughs> yeah. And then the somehow the topic came to uh, like rebirth. Then he simply started to glow, <laughs> and he said, "Tell me something more about this." And why are you interested in this? I asked him. He said that, say, Nigeria is predominantly Christian and Muslim country. Predominantly Christian and Muslim country. And what you are talking about, rebirth, no way in the scripts of the Christianity and Islam you will find this. Yet, if you go to the villages, Nigerian villages, you will see many small children who talk about something of the past. Saying that, this is not my home. My home in, is in this village. And they could even specify the name of the parents, specify the names of the, the brothers and sisters, name of the village. And this phenomenon is totally non-existent in Christianity. And in Islam. And yet these are happening. People have no clue what is happening there, what is this child saying. So some of them, out of curiosity, took the child to the place where the child was identified that that is my home. And the child was taken there. The moment the child gets there, the child behaves as though like he knows the place so well. He or she knows the place so well. And go to the place without somebody leading him or her. He would take the, the parents and the relatives to the place and enter the house and say, this is my place, and identify the people be here. So he said that, we have no clue what is this. And in the, the scriptures, holy scriptures, no mention of this is there. So this is something everybody get lost. This happened there, this happened there, this so obviously there, you can actually rectify it so well, and yet nothing is spoken about it in the ancient books available there. 
So these things are really, you know, this is what I first had the, the first hand experience I had with the displacement of Nigeria. Okay, we stop here.